it's exactly 8.30, so we'll get, we'll get started. Um, thank you all for coming to this presentation. My name is Natasha Bowens, and I'm author of The Color of Food, Stories of Race, Resilience, and Farming. Welcome. Um, and I just want to start by saying this presentation is a little different from all the presentations here. You know, we're all here to make ourselves uh, better farmers, learn as much as we can about biological farming, and uh, we're not going to do any of that in here. <laughs> not directly in that way. This presentation is really a way to kind of stop what we're doing, stop kind of moving forward just eager to learn how we can be more sustainable, and really zoom out and look at the picture of our movement, right? And are we being holistically sustainable? Um, I don't know if you all were here for the keynote yesterday, but um, he mentioned having three requirements to be sustainable. We have to be ecologically sustainable, economically sustainable, and we have to be socially responsible. That's part of sustainability too. And I feel like that piece is one that often goes overlooked. Um, maybe socially responsible kind of means to some folks fair trade, fair wages for our farm workers. But I also feel like there's another piece. Is it socially responsible, for example, to have a movement that might be exclusive, that might be extremely dispro disproportionate in its representation of our community as a whole, right? Our population of eaters, consumers. Um, are, we a, are we kind of looking at that? You know, are we scaling back and really looking at ourselves and making sure that we're being inclusive and that we're being socially responsible and fairly representing the community that we're serving? For example, do we even realize how disproportionate the representation, the community of farmers really is? 94% of our farmers are white. Does that represent today's country? <laughs> a third of our population is non-white, and it's growing. In 15 to 20 years, the minority will be the majority, is what a lot of statistics are proposing. Right, so that's, that's an extreme disparity. And why is that important? You know, as long as we have people growing food, what does it matter what color they are? Well, I think it matters definitely for quite a few reasons. Um, for example, our population, if it's a third people of color, and the vast majority of communities of color, our consumers, our food eaters, are suffering at a disproportionate rate from diet-related illnesses. Uh, the majority of food deserts are in communities of color. Um, you know, culturally relevant foods aren't available. Where does that fit in to food access and, and health? So it's important that the farmers and the food leaders that are trying to address these situations come from these communities. I think that's socially responsible. Another reason, and it's more personal, you know, you, I'm a young beginning farmer. And to get me excited, to get into farming, to make me feel like this is an area for me, I want to see people like me. You know, 94% um, the, the of the farmers are white and they're aging out. Who's going to replace our farmers? The average age of the farmer today is 58. And for the black farmer, it's 63. Who's, who's going to be the next, the next farmers? How are we going to engage them? How are we going to understand what's going on in these communities? and bring in new farmers. Um, you know, it's hard to get excited when you feel like this arena is not for you. I mean, I get excited, I go home and I read Elliot Coleman, and I just bought J.M. Fortier's book yesterday, I can't wait to go home and read it. Um, but I'm just a little more excited if I can read Booker T. Watley's book on how to make $100,000 farming on small acreage. If I can read Will Allen's book, about vermicomposting and urban farming, because I see a little bit of myself in him. Um, you know, and J.M. Fortier, I don't know if any of you were in his presentation yesterday, but he kind of touched on it. He said that him and his wife farmed around. They went to Mexico farming a little bit. They were in Cuba farming a little bit. But his biggest influence, it felt like where he learned the most, was with another Francophone farmer. He had a connection there. You know, we need to build those connections in our communities to draw people into farming, to make them feel like this is for you. Um, so those are some of the, the reasons why 
I think it's really important to be looking at the face of our farming community and be socially responsible and make sure we're being holistically sustainable. So that's what this presentation is all about. And really it's what this project is all about, is going out and trying to look at these overlooked communities of farmers and really understand what's going on in these communities culturally. And I personally think that storytelling is a great way to do that. So I found myself out on the road collecting stories from farmers of color all over the country. And um, this was back in 2012. I found myself in a 1990 Oldsmobile station wagon, driving all over the country for five months straight, talking to over 75 farmers from Maryland down to Mississippi, over to the Navajo Nation in Arizona, and all the way to the west coast of Washington. It was a crazy journey. And I often, on the long roads, would ask myself, you know, how did I end up here? I just wanted to farm. And, and here I am digging in, instead of to the soil, I'm digging into all these wonderful, amazing stories. What, is, what was really pushing me to kind of zoom out and look at this picture of farming? And I think this Alice Walker quote really sums it up for me on a very personal level and on many different levels. Um, being a mixed kid raised by a white mother, I always felt like I was in search of my own place in my mother's garden, right? Figuratively speaking, finding my own place in mainstream white culture as a biracial kid. And that didn't change when I got into farming. In, in fact, I think it uh, was emphasized even more into this kind of mainstream white area. The whitest trade, I heard a, a um, NRDC lawyer who's uh, holding a panel at the next Harvard Just Food Conference say, you know, this is the whitest trade in America, farming, 94%. And, and so I joined this, I'm out in the fields, and, and I just felt like I had to find my own place and my own agrarian story and have something to identify with. So that's, that's kind of how I ended up out on the road. And uh, like I said, I interviewed over 75 different farmers. Uh, all, I didn't do a film documentary. This is a photographic storytelling project. So I interviewed everyone using audio recording, transcribed all their interviews. And, um, and now it's, it's being published by New Society Publishers in a book. Uh, that will be out in April. And I am taking pre-orders, so, and there's also um, <clears throat> clips of stories and photos that you can follow on the website. Um, so that's kind of how the project got started. But let's back up a little bit. How did I even come in to farming? Um, I didn't grow up farming. I didn't grow up around any farming communities. I'm from metropolitan South Florida, and I was born in Newark, New Jersey, probably some of the farthest away you can get from rural farming community. Uh, you know, my parents didn't farm, but like many young farmers today, I got into farming for ecological reasons. I really felt a strong concern for my environment. I was working in advocacy and activism um, in Washington, D.C., working for the Center for American Progress, working on health care, working on social justice issues, working on environmental issues, and I really felt like food and agriculture was the elephant in the room. It was kind of connecting the dots between all of these, these issues that I was working on. Uh, the light went off for me, and I started just immersing myself in this community of food movement activists and urban farmers and community gardens in DC. And eventually, I left my job and my stable job in 2010 <laughs> and, uh, and went and started working on organic farms. And I ended up barefoot on an organic hippie commune farm in the middle of West Virginia. And I was in love. I had found my path. I was connecting with the soil. I was actually making a difference with my hands. And uh, I, I had found my place. But I started to kind of look around. Uh, we would go to farmers markets in and around West Virginia. You know, even in DC, I had been going to conferences and going to different community gardens and, you know, this is the, this is the chocolate city, but, but the food movement at that point still felt exclusive. You know, there were farmers markets setting up shop in Latino and different communities of color, and they were mainly being run by white farmers, no culturally relevant foods, 
you know, no bilingual staff at the farmer's markets, you know, I, I started to really question my, my, crunchy, my crunchy love affair that I was having in the organic movement. Was it for me? Did I belong there? You know, was I the face of this movement? And um, so, you know, speaking about our roots, I started to wonder, okay, so, so my mother, you know, she didn't farm. A lot of my family members never farmed. But if I think back, my paternal great-grandmother, I, I came from a long line of farmers. I came from a long line of sharecroppers. You know, my paternal great-grandmother, she grew up on a farm. Her father was a sharecropper. You know, they were growing food. They knew how to grow food organically before organic was the term, right? Down in South Carolina, they know how to grow their okra and, and their greens and their tomatoes with chicken waste fertilizer, right? So, so I kind of came from this movement that is now, the face of it has kind of changed, you know? So my great-grandmother and, and, and descendants of, of, of African enslaved people who came here to cultivate the soil and indigenous people who were cultivating this land before any of us got here. You know, that was the, those were the first faces of agriculture, right? So, so what has happened? Because now, this is the face. This is the face of healthy food and organic. This is the face of, of you know, getting back to the land. And there's plenty of people who don't, who don't, who are not represented with this face. You know, I started, like I said, I'm getting excited with the food movement. I'm reading articles, you know, I'm, I'm, young farmers are coming back. And, um, but, but this is the face of it. You, you look at the magazines, you look at the articles, you read the books, you know, everyone's saying that this is Michigan's young farmers. Detroit is in Michigan, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Where are my Detroit farmers? Um, this one here, this is the Capitol Beltway, yeah, the young farmers issue. DC, you know, this is, this is representation. So, so what do I tell young folks in the southeast of DC, um, you know, in parts of Virginia and part, all over the country, what do I tell young folks of color when I'm trying to say, we've lost connection with the land, this is a, this is a huge tie to what is happening in our communities as far as health, as far as food access. We need to get back to the land with these folks. We belong there, we do. You know what I mean? So, so, th so that was missing for me. <clears throat> and, um, and it wasn't just about media and the representation of farmers. Like I said, at the farmers markets, you know, um, if, if people of color aren't being represented in this story, where else are they being left out? Are they being left out of this organic movement for food access? Are healthy farmers markets opening up in their communities? Things are changing over the past five years, you know, since I started this project, we're definitely starting to see more of this, you know, changing. But, uh, you know, our Whole Foods in, in the Lower Ninth Ward in New Orleans or in Detroit, you know, in areas of Detroit. So, so how else are we not being inclusive as we're pushing forward in this really exciting movement? And how else are we not being, how else are, in, a, in what ways are uh, folks of color being left out of the system? Farmers of color, right? Um, I'm not sure if you all, we're gonna learn more about it later. How many people are familiar with the Pigford uh, USDA lawsuit, black farmers against the USDA, which after that followed Hispanic native women farmers suing the USDA for discrimination, loans being denied strictly based on race. And they've proven it, so many claims. So many claims, we'll, we'll hear more about that later, but so other ways that, that we're kind of leaving folks out of this movement and what, what impacts that have, you know? Again, we'll get to it later, but in 1920, black farmers were almost one million strong. Now, black farmers make up roughly 1% of the farming community. Um, you know, there's many reasons for this, but if they're being literally left out and denied out of the system, how do we expect to stay in the game? So, so just looking at the full spectrum of, of, of exclusiveness for this, this movement, the food and agriculture movement. You know, and I started to get frustrated because when I did see people of color represented 
in this movement. It was either talking about food deserts, food stamps, or farm workers. You know, our story has got to be more than that. You know, do the vast majority of communities of color, you know, is that where food deserts are? Yes. Are there many people of color on food stamps? Yes. But is that our only agrarian story? Is that the only story for us in this movement? No. You know, to quote Dr. Monica White, who is an amazing, fantastic advocate for black agriculture. She works with the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network in, in, uh, in Detroit, and she's a professor there in uh, University of Wisconsin. She says, our story, our agrarian story as people of color is so much richer than that. You know, we may have, we may be known, and our story may be written as far as, you know, for, for descendants of uh, black enslaved, that slavery kind of defines agriculture for us. And, th and there's plenty of, of, of black folks that I talk to still today. When I started farming, and my girl Paula, who is Jamaican American, found out that I was going back to the farm, she was like, you, you're gonna go pick cotton? Come on. I mean, that stigma is still deep within many black communities. Right, and I get that, and we, and we do have to be sensitive to that, and we do have to educate ourselves on that, on that history and understand what's going on there. But that doesn't define us. That does not define us. You know, when, when, you, look at, um, when you look at the beginning of agriculture here in this country, like I said before, the real face of it are the indigenous folks here that were, that were stewarding this land long before we came here, and indigenous Africans that were picked to come here and work in the fields as slaves because of their agricultural knowledge. South Carolina, where 80% of slaves were brought in, was the home of cultivating rice. Rice came from West Africa, where folks there were cultivating rice long before slavery. They had wisdom, they had knowledge, they were connected with the land, you know, and that's exactly why folks went there and scooped them up and brought them over here to grow rice here, right? So we can, we can look at slavery, but we can also look at the skills and the wisdom and the legacy with the land that people had and be proud of that and dig into that and find our place in agriculture through that, right? All the contributions, the seeds brought over from, from various countries, Africa, all over the world, right? People are bringing crops here that, that is our agricultural system today, the crops that we have today. You know, they come from different communities and we need to, we need to really understand that and dig deeper into that. All right, where am I? So, so these, were all the, um, these were all the things floating in my, my little brain as I, as I was digging around on the farm, right? I couldn't just start farming. I felt like at, with every, you know, every, every time I dug my hands into the soil, th these are the things that I was thinking about. You know, I was planting seeds and, and thinking about my ancestors planting these same seeds. And so, you know, I had to find an outlet for all these thoughts and I had a lot of questions and I wanted to find solidarity, mostly. Out there on this hippie farm in West Virginia, I really needed to find solidarity. So I started writing um, on my blog, Brown Girl Farming, and uh, got picked up by Grist and, and wrote a series called The Color of Food. And you know, I was just kind of throwing all, all these thoughts around. And the response was overwhelming. I mean, I get chills now thinking about it. Folks of color from all over the country who were feeling the exact same way, feeling that frustration in search of that solidarity, wanting their voices to be heard because they had been on the ground doing this work for years and they didn't feel like they were getting the support or you know the kind of attention and deserved lifting up that they that they needed and uh, i just heard from so many people and that's really what inspired me to the inevitable next step was I, you know we need to hear from these folks there needs to be a space to hear these stories and to lift these folks up and to try to build this larger community of color and agriculture movement and, and, and I found out that really there were already these existing movements, right? I kind of found my holy grail. I found folks that had been doing this work 
and that we're holding workshops and sessions on dismantling racism in the food system and uh, you know growing power and, and all of these really beautiful movements. And, and I realized that I had been looking through the mainstream lens in agriculture. And when I started to look, you know, when I found my own garden and I was outside of my mother's garden, it was, it was beautiful. And I just felt like um, I wanted to do my little part to share some of these stories. So that's my kind of background. And, uh, you know, I went out and talked to a, a wealth of people and was blessed. There's Lucille, my station wagon. And actually, is Steph here? Steph is famous. <laughs> Steph, Paige Reese, and Tamara Elmore Young are some of the first farmers here in Richmond, actually, uh, urban farmers that I introduced. And now Steph is, is you know, she's, she's an experienced farmer. She, when I met her, she was just getting started. And this was, yeah, this was three years ago now. And she actually works with Pal Purple Mountain, who's selling all the wonderful farming tools upstairs and the books and whatnot. But anyway, so, so I get on the road, and that was my home for five months, that old station wagon. And, and the color of food has been the result. So I'm really excited to share some of the stories from the book with you today. Um, you know, now that I've given you my background, we're going to hear from some of these some of these farmers. And this is, again, an untraditional presentation. It's not a film documentary. This is a photographic storytelling documentary project. So you'll be looking at still portraits and listening to audio of, um, of some of the farmers. So we're going to start with uh, kind of what the first theme of the book starts with, and that is land, right? The most important aspect for all farmers. And uh, also, you know, land and the loss of which and, you know, the power dynamic that's at play when we think about land ownership is such a big piece in thinking about, you know, uh, land loss in communities of color and um, land ownership in communities of color. This is a quote from, um, from, what's his last name? Ralph from the Federation of Southern Cooperatives. His last name is escaping me right now. I have over 85 names at all times <laughs> in my head from this project. Um, but his quote is, land is the only real wealth in this country. And if we don't own any, we'll be out of the picture. And this here is Mr. Daniel Whitaker, who has since passed. He just passed last year, but I was able to interview him in 2012. At the time, he was a 93-year-old retired hog farmer in Tillery, North Carolina. And Tillery is a very special place. Tillery is a, was once a black resettlement community, one of about 15 that was created during uh, the resettlement administration under Roosevelt in the 30s. And uh, the Resettlement Administration was all about relocating struggling rural families uh, onto government-planned farming land, farming communities. And the way that they would kind of get back on their feet was to work the land for, for the government and pay off, pay off their land as they went. So uh, there was white resettlement communities, and there were about 15 black resettlement communities all over the country. Excuse me. And one of the biggest ones was Tillery in Tillery, North Carolina. So Mr. Whitaker you know, was a member of the resettlement community, and he remembers going there as a child, as most of the elders in Tillery remember. They came from sharecropping, and they saw Tillery as a new start, a fresh new start. You know, A lot of them called it the second 40 acres and a mule. They were again being promised by the government that they would have land, and they would be able to have this fresh, independent new start. And you know, they had their land, and they were working, but you know, discrimination was already in heavy existence in the South, as you know. And uh, you know, there was the white resettlement communities outside of the Tillery community. And a lot of the elders that I talked to, Mr. Whitaker included, told me about how you know their families would get the land down on the floodplains. That was the land they were given, while the white communities had the land, you know, up top. And so here they are trying to pay off their debt for this land. You know, they're planting, they're planting their crops, they're getting ready. We're in North Carolina, near the coast. Floods, storms, all the time coming through. You know, they lived through so many floods. Their crops would get washed out, 
they were still expected to, to, to meet their yield, to meet their, their debt, and it didn't happen. How can, how can they meet their yield when all their crops have been washed out, right? So there was just this constant game of catch up for these black communities. And, uh, and, and foreclosures started happening. You can't meet the yield, you can't meet the debt, your land was lost. Um, so Mr. Whitaker's story was beautiful because uh, even as a young man, he saw what was going on, you know, his family, they came from sharecropping, they wanted, they took their tillery plot. He refused to take, to take the plot. He did not want the government plot. He didn't want to work for anybody. He wanted to farm for himself. So Mr. Whitaker joined uh, the service, served in World War II, saved up some money, came home and bought his own land. He owned over 300 acres of land and he raised heritage hogs, grew some vegetables. You know, I, I sat with him in his home in Tillery and he had a beautiful glass case of, of memorabilia that his family had put together for him and, and on one of the shelves was an old cowbell and he said he would use that, that's, that's what got him going in his agriculture. He would ring that as he went through the streets selling his vegetables and selling his crops. And he made a living. He supported his five children and his wife off of his 300 acres. And uh, yeah, he just, he just had a beautiful story. And he wanted to hold on to that land. And he's passed on that acreage to his family. And, and, and that is so important. You know, I think that our communities forget this quote exactly. If, if we don't own any land, we're going to be left out of the picture. But it's also important to look at you know, the discrimination that was alive and the power dynamics that were at play and that are still at play when we talk about land ownership. And that leads us to another Tillery resident and a leader in the black agricultural movement and one of the biggest leaders in the Pigford um, lawsuit. This is Mr. Gary Grant and he's the head of the Black Farmers and Agriculturists Association based in Tillery. And they, they really worked for over 20 years to document the stories of black farmers and, and uh, pull together the black farmers to, to uh, join this Pigford lawsuit. Pigford, by the way, was the plaintiff who, um, who filed the lawsuit, and he's also from North Carolina, not far from Tillery. So Mr. Gary Grant is going to talk in a minute about a little bit about the Pigford lawsuit, if you're not familiar. Um, so just to give some background, there was Pigford 1 and Pigford 2. Um, so there were two different settlements. The, the first lawsuit was filed in the early 90s and it took a long time to reach settlement and took a long time to get those payments and, uh, and they left a lot of farmers out and so they, they did a pig for two where they kind of went and, and got thousands more farmers who, who felt discriminated against and who had loans denied. So, you know, when he's referencing, that's just a little background there. And he's also going to talk a little bit about the lawsuit and then about you know, how we talk about the importance of land ownership in the black community, how we change the conversation. No matter where the hearings were held, whether it was in Halifax County, whether it was in Mississippi, whether it was in California, all the black farmers were telling the same story. I don't get my... I'm told there's no money, I'm not given an application, I am told it's, it's in the process, I get my money after the window of planting season, you know. So that's why we know that it was a national crisis. And if our ancestors from slavery up until 1900 could manage to get almost 17 million acres of land, mm -hmm. and we have lost 70, 80% of it between 1920 and 1996, something wrong, my daddy would say, something wrong. Something is wrong. But when we go back and look, you know, in the first, in Pickford one, there were 30, 23,000, 23, 
23,000 applicants, I believe it was, and only 12,000 of them were successful. When we look at who was successful, it was folk who were like me, who went in to get a loan and were mistreated, who had lost their land, who were no longer in farming, and who had no intention of going back into farming. Very few of the folk who were farming were successful in Pickford. Why? Because the ultimate goal of USDA was to put small farmers out of business. And they have pretty much, pretty much done it. You, are, you got 990,000 black farmers in uh, <clears throat> 1920, and by the year 2000, remember the quote? By the year 2000, you have less than 20,000 farmers. Mm -hmm. They're gone. You're not even a political mass to be dealt with. Not even a political mass to be dealt with. And the average age of the black farmer is older than the, than the overall farming population. It's 63. And that was the 2007. I don't know if it's gone up since then. And you heard his outlook on, on uh, the USDA, you know, and how, what he feels the mission of the USDA is. Not all you know, small farmers might not feel that same way, but can you blame him for feeling that way after seeing what has happened to the black farming community over all of these years? You know, and how can we motivate new and young black farmers to join a trade that they feel like is trying to push them out? You know, on top of already the negative stigma that I talked about with, with the black community and agriculture, then we, we see this. We see this, you know, this slow death of the black farmer. How are we supposed to get motivated to join this trade? But I think Mr. Grant says here, it's about changing the conversation, right? It's like I said before, it's about looking at, at what land ownership has allowed our communities to do when we have held on to it, right? When we, when, we, when we were able to acquire that land, you know, like he said, up from slavery, we were able to acquire land that, you know, is impressive. And, and what were we able to do with that land and what today are communities still able to do with that land? So it's about changing the conversation, I'll say here. You can't convince people that farming is the thing. So let's start talking about land ownership and what that allows you to do. Okay, you just know? change the conversation. So you change the conversation. If you can't relate to uh, farming, you don't want to relate to farming. Let's talk about land ownership. So, you know, it's, it's true. Um, you know, I talk to, I'm starting a youth urban farm in Frederick, Maryland, where I live, and I've, I've been on many uh, kind of youth educational farms, and I, and I ask these farmers, you know, are you trying to get every kid to become a farmer? Is everyone excited about farming? No, of course not. We can't get every, everyone to become a farmer. But can we talk about how important land ownership is, how important keeping land in our communities is, because what does that allow us to do? And I'd like to move to uh, Sarah Reynolds Green story and her story of land ownership because she's on land that has been in her family since 1892. And she is down on St. Helena Island, the Gullah Islands of South Carolina. And uh, if anyone's not familiar with Gullah culture and the Gullah Islands, they run pretty much from North Carolina down through Florida. And uh, there are islands that date, the culture there dates back to the days of slavery when West African uh, enslaved folks were brought over. And you know these islands were so isolated that they were able to really keep their culture alive. You know, the language, the food, you know, the art, the culture is still there and thriving. And, and it's a beautiful West African rooted culture down uh, along all of these islands, the Gullah Islands, through the Carolinas and North Florida. And St. Helena is kind of the, the epicenter of these islands. And it's also the home to the Penn Center, which is one of the first African American uh, schools. And, and, a, and a huge headquarters uh, throughout the black movement, the black power movement, and civil rights movement. So, so Sarah is a uh, guidance counselor at St. Helena Elementary School and a farmer there. And her and her husband, Mr. Bill, 
Green, who also is owner of a restaurant called the Gullah Grub. So he's chef, owner, and farmer, um, and, a, and a huntsman. They run this farm, Marshview Community Organic Farm. And they are the only CSA farm on St. Helena Island, or they were as of 2012. Um, and they also run a youth program there. So they're really doing great things in their community, and they're doing it on this land that has been in Sarah's family since the 18, late 1800s. And uh, I'm going to let her talk a little bit about you know, this land that she lives on and you know, just how the disconnect from our land as a community uh, and by generation really impacts you know, this, this loss of uh, identity with the land, knowledge with the lands, and with our food. We live on a land that was, has been in our family one part of it has been in there since 1892. Mm -hmm. I saw a deed where my great-grandfather purchased 20 acres of land and you know um, they freed the slaves here in 1861 mm -hmm. so um, 30 years later he was able to purchase 20 acres of land which was I thought was very commendable no, and uh, my other um, great-grandfather he was a county extension agent mm. um, which helped the farmers and all of the people in the, in the area um, to farm you know what to you how to use their utilize their land to be profitable to be self-sufficient and Penn Center was the epicenter for teaching all of the um, inhabitants of the island you know how to be self-sufficient what to do how to um, create an environment where you didn't need to go to Buford mm -hmm. and make that long trip to get things that you um, needed in order to survive. You could survive within that, say, in that community. Mm -hmm. And if one person uh, was a farmer and they farmed a lot of like sweet potatoes, then they will share that with, with the other person. Okay. If someone else was growing um, uh, tomatoes or cucumbers or squash or greens or whatever, everyone shared. And if this person was um, raising cattle, whenever he killed a, uh, a cow, then you'll have a piece of that, or a hog, they have a piece of that. So it was communal. Everyone knew, oh, such and such is killing a hog today. So everyone would go to that person's house and early in the morning, and they'll all have their you know pieces to take home before they left there. So that family would be fed. And that's how my um, father's house, my mother and father's house was built. Um, all the family members got together and they came every Saturday and piece by piece. They all worked together, put in that house together. My father was a carpenter, so, and he um, had brothers and cousins that had different skills. And so they all, com um, you know, combined their skills and put it together and made it, made life. Um, worth living for everyone mm -hmm. and without much hardship on one person. Mm -hmm. So I, I love that concept and I, and I try to live it and try to pass that, that knowledge and that way of living to the children, mm -hmm. the sharing, you know, because right now everyone is more my, me, me, me. Right. And How do you think we got from that to this place, you know? Because we relied on other people mm -hmm. for our, um, for the things that we need mm -hmm. instead of try and create it within our own means. We're relying with, to, it's in, let's starting with the food. Mm -hmm. When we, once we stopped growing our own food, we relied on the grocery stores for everything instead of the garden, the farms, mm -hmm. and the, the, the dirt that is right in, that we walk on every day. So how much does this sound like this movement that we're all pushing forward now, right? This, this cooperative, this communal, this shared economy, this you know, self-sufficient self, uh, farmer back to the land. You know, don't be dependent on the grocery stores. They're feeding us sick food. You know, th this, is, this is what I'm talking about when I say our story is so much richer than that. Right here in our history, people have been doing this. You know, this is how, this is what they were doing for survival. This is what they were doing because they were isolated. You know, she said, we don't have to go to Beaufort to get anything. They would have to get on a boat to go across to Beaufort. 
self-sustaining communities. And we're reverting back to that because I think as a whole, all of us people miss that sense of community. You know, Sarah talked about, um, you know, when I was sitting with her, that our gener each, with each generation, people are moving off the farm, they're moving out of the country, we're moving to cities, you know, to have the good life. And, uh, and we're, we're realizing that something is missing. And, we're, and, and that's kind of why we're reverting back to, to this old way of, of living communally. You know, she even talked about herself as a young person. She wanted to get off St. Helena Island. You know, the, it was like the, the end of the world. So she moved to Atlanta. She was doing her thing. But she started to yearn for things. She started to yearn for the language. You know, if you've ever been to the Gullah Islands, it's kind of a rich Patois, Caribbean, uh, you know, unique language. And she, she started to yearn for her culture. She started to yearn for the foods, you know, the place, the marsh. Um, and, and she went home to, to get that back, but also to instill that in the next generation. Her and Mr. Bill, who I think I've pictured here, um, they, they run a youth program, as I mentioned, and these youth that are farming, they have a program that, that is teaching them skills from seed to table, because Mr. Bill owns Gullah Grub Restaurant, and they use a lot of the, the produce from the farm uh, in the restaurant. And these young people who call themselves the young farmers of the low country, because if you're familiar with Carolina, the low country is the area along the coast there. And, uh, and they are on the farm learning farming skills, and then they're, they're in the kitchen with Mr. Bill learning how to cook you know, his famous Gullah rice and a lot of Gullah cuisine. And then a, a lot of, and they're being paid for this program, and a lot of the older children are also working and serving in the restaurant. So they're gaining all of these skills, but they're also really understanding this communal, this, this culture, this community um, on this land that, that Sarah grew up with and that you know, their ancestors, all of their ancestors grew up with. They're, they're preserving that. And that, that, that is so important. And, and that's our story. That's our agrarian story, right? So these kids are understanding, not only is this for me, but this is a part of where I come from. You know, this is a part of my culture. This is what we've always been doing. This isn't just some new movement of, you know, let's start a commune, you know? So, um, so that's really important. And, um, you know, I also want to point out that the kind of resilience in seeing how Sarah is still on this land that's been in her family since 1892 and all the oppression uh, that happened, you know, St. Helena and the Gullah Islands and the South really was the heart of slavery and the heart of oppression and the heart of racism uh, for so long. But to know that there's still communities like hers that are holding on and that are surviving and thriving and, and growing new leaders is a beautiful thing. And resilience is another piece, a uh, big theme of, of the Color of Food book that I um, focus on. And here's a little bit, there's the Gullah Grub restaurant. Some good food, I tell you what, if you ever get down to St. Helena Island in South Carolina. I think I was supposed to be talking through all this, so I'll let you look at some of these photos. And then we're going to move on to another story of resilience. Here we are. So, so we've talked about uh, the decline of black farmers and, um, and uh, you know, just kind of the story of, of really the, the death of the black farmer. And this woman right here, Cynthia Hayes, is responsible for resiliently giving life back to the black farming community throughout the South. She's the head of the Southeastern African American Farmers uh, Farming Organic Network. And her and uh, Dr. Awusu Bandeli, who is an agricultural professor emeritus, here he is, uh, at Southern University in Louisiana, started SAFON, started the Southeastern African American Farming Organic Network. And you know, Cynthia did this because she saw, her quote was, you know, I wanted to find a way for black farmers to save their land. And I saw that the organic industry was booming, so it just made sense. And Sa Safon works uh, with over 122 farmers 
across eight states and in the Caribbean. And they are not only training black farmers on um, how to become organic certified, but they're supporting them through the process, that 19-page application. Uh, they're kickstarting some of the startup costs. And uh, they're just connecting farmers to resources. You know, if they're being blocked at their local USDA office or being blocked from something, Cynthia's on that phone, Dr. Bendeli's on that phone, and they're helping farmers kind of overcome those hurdles and those barriers that are in the way. And, um, and they're helping farmers transition their land and learn how to transition their land from conventional to organic farming. And the network is, is, is vast and is taking off. They've actually just moved into Virginia, so I think they're looking for more um, black farmers in Virginia. <laughs> and I'm going to go through and let you see some of the Saffon farmers. Cynthia was uh, vital in, in out. that's her husband, Mr. Hayes. And uh, they also started a farmer's market in, um, in Savannah where they're headquartered. And actually it's in the, that's Mr. Bill from, um, from St. Helena Island. And um, they're, the farmer's market that Saffon started in Savannah is in Forsyth Park, which is a park that uh, just as late as the 1960s, black folks could not walk through. And now they have uh, an African-American organic farming, farmer's market there. So that is really, really exciting. And a, a lot of these farmers I interviewed because Cynthia was, was vital um, in helping me outreach to farmers for the project. And this farm I want to touch on because you talk about resilience. And this farm, you know, the, the story still sends chills. It's, uh, and gives me goosebumps. This is uh, Yasin and his wife, Elaine Muhammad. And uh, they, they didn't come from farming. They were in New Orleans, and they were in the education system. And they were there when Katrina hit. And um, you know the most devastating hurricane this country has seen. And you know they lost everything. They lost absolutely everything. And they had to go up. Uh, near Baton Rouge where some family lived and stay with them on, on their land. But, you know, Yassine talked about how when Katrina came and, I mean, everything was wiped out. Food reserves, you know, all the food went bad. No food on the grocery store shelves. Grocery store was wiped out. You know, it really was a wake-up call for him and his wife about how dependent we are on the food system and how when, that, when you're so dependent on a system that is so fragile, you know, what that means for, for your survival. So it was a wake-up call for him and his, his wife, who are Muslim and have always practiced clean eating and eating halal. And, uh, and then they found themselves out on this rural land outside of New Orleans on their family's land in Zachary, Louisiana, and they just started kind of putting it all together. Here they had this land. They could do something with it. They could continue eating clean as they had been, but they could not be dependent on a system that they saw was so fragile for their own food. So they started, they started to learn about farming and they started, they started going to classes, they started just kind of figuring it out and now they run Yardbird Farm, which is an extremely successful chicken farm and they process their meat on site. This was um, you know, their, their uh, killing station, I'm sure there's a fancier term. <laughs> Um, where they were, you know, slaughtering their chickens and, and cleaning and processing their chickens. They process halal and they sell to a large halal community throughout Louisiana. And actually, um, uh, the local university was there the day that I was there interviewing them, testing their chickens um, to prove that their organic standards are, are healthier. And um, they're sending folks over to, to learn from their slaughtering facility because they've just They've just grown into a really great farm. They process, I think, over um, 300 chickens a week. And, uh, and I just think their story is so beautiful because they came from losing everything. And now neither of them have to work outside jobs. They are fully sustainable running their farm. And I just think that's a beautiful story of resilience. But this isn't just about black farmers, right? This is the color of food, stories of race, resilience, and farming across all communities of color. And uh, black folks certainly aren't the only communities that have suffered oppression and um, devastation and have resiliently 
come back from that. So um, I want to share with you some other numbers from the agricultural census as far as where communities of color stand in representation. Uh, Asian American farmers make up just 0.8% of the farming population. Native American farmers just 2.6% and Latina farmers about 3.7%. But we have to remember when looking at the ag census, they, there's no data on ownership. I think that's changing. This summer, there's, uh, I just was reading a new report coming out that is going to break down land owners. Right now, the ag census is talking about farm operators. So I, 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 you know, while we see these percentages, I think they're even lower when we talk about who owns the farm, right? Not just who's the head. Um, and then, of course, women, only 13%. So we are also in the minority. Right, so this is about more communities. This is about communities who have migrated here, often from rural and agricultural communities, countries, bringing skills and knowledge, but running into many barriers within our agricultural system. Many are left with little choice but to become farm labor, working in conventional and big ag farms, as we know, um, and under co oppressive conditions for low wages, but there is a movement where a lot of farm workers are transitioning from farm worker to farm owner. And uh, one of these stories is Nelida. And uh, Nelida Martinez is in Washington, in North Washington State. And she came here from Oaxaca, Mexico. And she started migrating up through the fields of California and Washington, working on, on uh, berry farms. And she realized, she kind of had this wake-up call as well, where you know, she's working in this really oppressive environment. She's working with very toxic chemicals, where you know, her bosses would tell her, when you go home and wash your work clothes, don't wash them with, with your regular clothes. Don't wash them with your family's clothes, because those toxins are going to get right in there and, and, and seep into your skin and affect your whole family. Well, her son ended up get, getting leukemia. And as Nelida started researching leukemia and all of these illnesses um, and, and putting the connections together with the toxins that, that we are, are flooding our planet with and, and her work every day with these toxic chemicals, she realized no more did she want to work in this, this field. She wanted to start her own farm, organic farm, free of these chemicals. And she wanted to do that for the health of her family. But how does, how does a farm worker living in a farm worker um, subsidized community get the kind of capital and the kind of start and, and someone who does not speak English navigate the USDA system and, and try to start her own farm? Well, there are a lot of great programs that are out there supporting this movement of uh, farm worker to farm owner transitions and just supporting you know, um, immigrant and, and Latino farmers and different culture farmers all over the country to navigate some of these barriers. One of those organizations is the National Immigrant Farming Initiative, uh, run by Rigoberto Delgado. And also, there's some great programs like the one that Nelida was a part of, Viva Farms. And Viva Farms is an incubator farm in North Washington. And I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with incubator farms. Some of them vary in their differences of what they offer. But Viva Farms um, is on organic land, and they provide land. Um, land. They have a farmer's market stand, which you just saw, uh, coolers, a washing station. They help access. They help connect farmers to distributors. They help with marketing. They even sell under the Viva Farms brand, right? So a kind of cooperative marketing and, and irrigation, everything you need to start. They even offer classes, um, kind of like a beginning farmer's training program. And you have to go through that program in order to then be able to, to, um, to lease the land. And you pay a small fee, you, you rent the land, and you get all of, all of the things you need to get started. So this is, this is amazing, an amazing opportunity for folks who don't have the capital to get started, you know, who, who might have trouble because of language barrier um, reaching markets themselves. And so Nelida was able to take uh, advantage of the Viva Farms program. And she now 
She now has land at Viva Farms still, but also has her own land and her own farm. She farms under Viva Farms and sells under Viva Farms, but she also runs her own farm called Pure Nelida. And um, she grows mainly berries and vegetables, and she sells at market, she sells to restaurants, and she also goes to market and makes added value products. She makes um, tortillas with her squash blossoms. And um, she's a star. They call her La Estrella because she is just, she's, uh, she's killing it over there. And I, I just think that that's such a beautiful story. And she, you know, her, her son is still surviving and is re in recovery from leukemia. And she's able to, you know, feed her family organic foods and, um, and do this for her family and her community. And we're going to hear from her a little bit of the challenges, you know, because it's definitely not easy for farmers coming here uh, to, to own their own farms. And she's going to talk a little bit about that and what she wants to do to help. She is speaking in Spanish, but there's a translation, so. So yeah, it's uh, a lot of us come here, and it's a lot of humiliation sometimes mm -hmm. for people that come. Yeah, this is most of those, yeah. No, they come. But, yeah, so because of that reason, like a lot of like no one even thinks about doing their own, like because they feel kind of degraded by the, the work. So. Sometimes it's a lack of communication between like the uh, couple mm -hmm. about like what can we do or what do we want to do. So that's Nelida's story, and uh, you know, there's many, many stories like hers. And uh, thanks to organizations that are that are not overlooking these communities, but seeing these communities and seeing that, uh, you know, with the influx of immigrant farmers coming in, instead of keeping them in oppressive farm working positions, that we can build them, we can help them empower themselves to to reach their goals and become farm owners. And uh, as I said, with, with the farming population aging out, who are going to be our next farmers? And NIFI, the National Immigrant Farming Initiative, thinks that immigrant farmers can really make up a lot of um, you know the next farmers if we are going into these communities understanding you know where they're coming from she talked about how hard it is because farm workers are they're humiliated they're degraded you know how, how can we look inside ourselves and think yes I'm, I'm going to be a farm owner one day so we have to understand these dynamics right we have to understand what's going on we have to understand culture um, we have to you know be speaking their language and we have to go in and, and lift up these communities and NIFI is doing that um, all over the country. This is another example of a farmer that NIFI is supporting. Um, and this is Luis Castañeda, and he's in Chaparral, New Mexico. And he was also came uh, from Mexico and was a farm worker. And now he's a farm owner with a cooperative farm called Solar with two other families in, Mex in uh, New Mexico, Chaparral. And, uh, you know, you talk about food deserts, which 
frustrates a lot of communities, especially communities living in the desert, because the term food desert uh, pretty much is, is saying that food cannot grow in deserts. Uh, I think Luis and Solar is, is, um, is a shining example that that is not true. The, that his farm was one of the most lush and abundant farms I have seen in my journey, and we were in the middle of the Chihuahuan Desert. Um, and he's farming organically, and, uh, and he's making it work. And, and him and the other families that are farming, they grow, and they started a farmer's market in their community, which had no market there before. We also have to remember that, ironically, in a lot of these agricultural communities and farm worker communities, people who are growing food for America, there's no real food there, right? In the Chihuahuan Desert, chilies um, and peppers are one of the biggest crops grown. You can't live off of just chili and peppers. There's no grocery stores. There are no farmer's markets with a variety of produce. So, so um, Luis and Solar are also addressing food access in their community. They started a farmer's market. Um, they want to start a community kitchen, a certified kitchen, where they can make added value products like acerero cheese and uh, cubiertos, which is like a Mexican candy made from calabaza, made from squash. And, and sell these at market. And the last I talked to Luis, they're actually partnering with um, a group of, of women in Mexico called Cassava Creations. And they make kind of artisan handcrafts. And they're starting a market together that is going to sell crafts, food uh, for their community. And, it's, and it kind of plays into this shared economy thing that's a big term right now, right, in, in our communities to kind of have this solidarity economy where we're lifting each other up and we're working within our communities to create our own economic success. And Luis is a great example of that. And, and yeah, you talk about resilience and, and harsh climate, climate and life persisting. And you can see some of his farm there and they are definitely surviving and thriving in the harsh climate of the Chihuahuan Desert. And another example of someone surviving uh, in, in a harsh climate, here's a nice quote. So growing food for us is a cultural tradition, and cultural traditions don't just s sustain themselves, they need community. And the next story I want to share, oh, I guess I didn't put his picture in there. Um, the next story I want to share is from another uh, immigrant farmer from Laos. Uh, he's a Hmong farmer, and I'm sorry I don't have his picture here. I don't know how that happened. But um, his name is Pang Chang, and him and his wife came over. They were Hmong refugees, and if folks aren't familiar with the Hmong um, you know, population, they are, they are basically considered ethnic minorities throughout China, Thailand, Laos, Vietnam. And they were targeted um, mainly in Laos and Vietnam by the CIA to help fight in the Vietnam War. Um, so after the war, they were targeted by, by their own people, and they were forced to flee their countries. Many of them came here to the States, also to Australia and France. And a large population um, of Hmong folks are in California, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. And so I found myself in Fresno, California, with, with Peng Chang. And um, I'm really sorry. His Photo's not up here, but uh, <laughs> that's not him. Um, and, and so he, he fled. He had some horrible uh, memories and stories of, of that time fleeing Laos and coming to California. And he found himself in Fresno, also a farm worker. Fresno is a huge agricultural uh, region in central California. But he really wanted to grow things from his home country. And folks told him that it wasn't possible, but he made it possible. Uh, Peng Cheng run, runs PEC Tropical Farm, which grows jujubes, which are Chinese dates, um, papaya, mango, guava, and he's growing in a greenhouse. And I tell you, when I walked into this greenhouse, it was like walking into a lush jungle environment. I don't know how he was making it happen in the dry, arid climate of Central Valley, California, but. Um, I was brought there by one of the one of University of California's extension agents, Michael Yang, who is also Hmong, and works to support and engage the Hmong farming population in Central California. And he said that Peng is always at all of the classes, um, you know, there learning as best he can how he can 
make these plants from another country that aren't native to the soil survive and thrive. And he himself was doing that. Him and his wife have put their 12 th children through school um, just running their farm. There's no, there's no competition. He's meeting a demand in California for locally grown tropical fruits, and, and uh, he is also killing it. So, so that's another beautiful story of resilience. Um, and I'm sorry I don't have her photo here, but I guess I also wanted to share another Laotian farmer in, um, outside of Portland, Oregon, Selena with Selena and Bay's farm. She also has a beautiful farm, migrated here from, from Laos in the 1980s and is selling, um, they subsist off of their farm, they're selling at market, as selling cut flowers as well as vegetables. So not only are these stories um, beautiful stories of resilience, but also powerful food sovereignty stories, right? These folks have come here, and they're taking ownership over their food. And um, food sovereignty for me also means you have ownership over your food, and it's, it's culturally relevant to you, right? These are your foods that you're bringing here. Pang and Selena both um, have brought foods from their home, home country that they're bringing here and introducing these crops into market and meeting demands and introducing um, you, you know, new ethnic crops and cultural crops to the overall market. And, and they have ownership over that. And food sovereignty is, is really important. It's a term that's getting thrown around a lot now. And uh, I think it means many things. We talk about ownership over land, seeds, our food, but also food ways. And uh, this is the last piece we're going to end with, just kind of exploring what traditional foodways means for some communities <coughs> and how we can kind of preserve that. So this is Kevin Welch of the Cherokee Nation. Um, he's a member of the Eastern Band of Cherokee, which resides in um, North Carolina on the border of Tennessee near the Great Smoky Mountains. And Kevin runs the Cherokee Center, the Center for Cherokee Plants. And the Center for Cherokee Plants is basically a seed bank. And they're bringing back heirloom Cherokee plants. And they're, they're growing seed and they're saving seed, but they're not, you know, he says we're a seed bank, but we're not really, they're not really banking their seeds. They give the seedlings out to the Cherokee community in garden kits. Um, and uh, as, we, as we know, Native Americans uh, suffer are one of the communities that suffer most from diabetes and diet-related illnesses, um, obesity, uh, very low income on the Cherokee Reservation. I think I have some stats here. 60% of the East Cherokee children are overweight or obese. 35% suffer from diabetes. And 25% of the Eastern Cherokee are, live at or below the poverty line. And I'm going to let Kevin talk a little bit about what they're doing to address this, but also about you know what the Cherokee story of agriculture is. Um, you know, he talks about how we see ag agriculture as, as only cultivating crops, but for a lot of native communities, agriculture and traditional foodways are about harvesting, hunting, fishing, and and how the impact of, of losing that, how the impact of losing their traditional homelands and their access to harvesting lands impacts the health of their community and the food ways of, and their food sovereignty. So for example, the, Cher the Eastern um, Cherokee land is 56,000 acres, which sounds like a lot, but it sits next to 11 million acres of the Smoky Mountains uh, National Park. 11 million acres that used to be part of their homeland, right? And now they're not allowed to go in there and hunt and harvest. Um, so yes, conservation, we see conservation as a good thing, but we have to remember these communities and we have to remember the dynamic at play when we're conserving 11 million acres of land that used to belong to another community where they used to get their food, their traditional foods, you know, and, and now they are no longer to, to harvest or hunt there and they're eating more of a Western diet and we see what's happening with their health, you know, we have to put these pieces together. So um, he's going to talk a little bit, I think, about that. One thing that's a misnomer a lot of times is that people assume that um, wild gathering is separate from agriculture or regular agriculture. Um, 
for native peoples, it's not. It's actually considered a part of agriculture for us um, in that we, uh, we don't differentiate between the plants that come from the woods and the plants that we grow from the ground. What we do here at, the, at this center for Cherokee Plants is we develop uh, culturally relevant varieties that our tribe uses and we put them back in the hands of the person that's put food on the table for their families. My job, although I do research, doesn't go into a book somewhere, it doesn't go on a shelf somewhere in some research. It goes into that family's refrigerator, into the pot, into the, their family. So that, that's, that's the very basis of what we do. We help provide seeds and our uh, tribal leaders have recognized um, the need for agriculture to be put back in our community. It's one of, it's one of the top ten um, the chief's initiatives. The chief's initiatives that were when when the surveys were done that they wanted to see, and so our chief started what uh, he called it, we call the chief's garden kit giveaway. And in the chief's garden kit giveaway, we give away uh, seven hundred garden kits. Uh, every year, wow. and those are family garden kits. They're not individual garden kits. Right. Plants that we do collect and cultivate uh, um, have a story that go on it with it. Um, to me, that's that's the fun part about collecting seeds, is what makes them relevant to any society, mm -hmm. and it applies to any group of people. Um, so the plants that we collect and propagate. Um, we interview elders, we do memory banking, and, and collect the oral histories. Um, when we find a, a plant, we try to propagate it, and especially if it's in short supply. Because mm -hmm. the job here, although we're a seed bank, is not to keep seeds here. Mm -hmm. Our job is to get them out there and, and to um, the enrolled members. But we don't, uh, we don't stop pile. Um, there's no need, no reason for us to stop pile. Um, a friend of ours uh, made the commentary, the best way to save an heirloom seed is to share it. When we give them to people, we give them, we empower them. So, to me that is just so powerful, right? We, we look at the food access, uh, the state of food access in the country right now, and we look at the food justice movement, and you know, when I say that the agricultural movement feels a little exclusive, so does the food justice movement in a lot of ways. Because I mean, even Walmart is co-opting food justice now. They're they're like, oh, no food will open a Walmart. There you go, problem solved. Uh, this is not how we address the <laughs> the problem, right? We need to understand what's going on in the community. Why, why, why this change in health? Is, has there been a change in diet? Are there, are those, is there no longer access to culturally relevant food? It's not just about access to any old food, right? And so I think what Kevin and the Center for Cherokee Plants is, is doing is, is, is the right way. They're going in and, and they are from the community, right? We need to be lifting up leaders in the community. Um, they are growing culturally relevant foods, and they are also empowering the community to feed themselves. They're giving out these garden kits, and, and folks are growing the food themselves. Like he said, the research isn't going into a book, it's going right into the fridge, right, in, right onto the tables. Um, and, and while doing all that, while addressing food access, while bringing agricultural back, they're also bringing back heirloom seeds and Cherokee plants that have been in existence for a really long time. And that's really important too, they're preserving culture. Um, another, and I saw a hand go up and I'm almost done and we can get to, to all the questions. Um, another group that is, is doing very similar work also in North Carolina is the American Indian Mothers and Three Sisters Farm. And they're based in Shannon, North Carolina and uh, Shannon, North Carolina is in Robeson County. And Robeson County is about 40% Native American. And it's also one of the poorest counties in the nation. Um, it's home to a lot of different Native American tribes. But one of the largest there are the Lumbee folks. And Lumbee, the Lumbee Nation um, is actually the largest Native population east of the Mississippi. 
uh, but they are not federally, federally recognized. And that's a whole other story we could get into another time. But, um, but anyway, so that's Robeson County. And American Indian Mothers was started by a group of mothers, one of them being Beverly Collins Hall, who is Iroquois, uh, Tuscarora, and Algonquin, and Cherokee. She's a mix. But she says, we're all the same people. Um, and Beverly worked as a home health uh, nurse. And she was working with a lot of the elderly in her community. And she found herself seeing that here the elders of her community were being forced to choose between buying medicine or buying food. And she saw that a lot of these elderly, since the poverty rate is so high in her county, uh, were going to food banks and getting this food that was not the food that they grew up with, that was not culturally relevant. Um, you know, canned foods and, and processed foods that was not helping their health condition at all. Uh, so she, she f and she grew up on a farm. Her father farmed cucumbers, um, tobacco, and uh, she, she thought that going back to agriculture was the answer. And if you're familiar at all with any Iroquois um, traditions, uh, three sis the three sisters represent corn, beans, and squash. Um, they have a ceremonial place um, in Native uh, culture, but they also have a really beautiful place in the garden. Nutritionally, they complement each other. Um, biolog biolog <laughs> in the garden, they complement each other. <laughs> um, you know, they work well together. And uh, so she started Three Sisters Farm her and these other mothers in their community. Because these mothers also were dealing with a lot of health issues with their kids. They were dealing with a lot of um, you know, issues with the kids in general, just keeping them, keeping them in school and keeping them on the right path. And so they started American Indian Mothers, who've been in existence for about 15 years, um, who've started this farm, who've started a canning operation. They're actually opening up a restaurant now. Um, they started their own food bank, where they're giving out culturally relevant foods to their community. And now Beverly is actually running for office in her county. I mean, she is a fierce fierce woman who is really trying to change the system. And American Indian Mothers also supports local small native farmers for you know, accessing and, and, and jumping over some of the hurdles and barriers that are in the way for native farmers as well. So the last story that I'm going to end with, and this is a, a vase of the three sisters that was in Beverly's home. And I think there'll be a picture of the, the corn, beans, and squash on the farm. And they're also doing nutritional education, youth programs. They're doing a lot of great things in their community there. And finally, um, another woman who is addressing nutrition, health, and food access in her community through farming and wild harvesting and traditional wild medicine and native foods is Valerie Seagrest. And she's a member of the Muckleshoot Tribe in Auburn, Washington. And she is a community health um, nutritionist, a community nutritionist, and a native foods educator. And the Muckleshoot are Salish, Salish and Coast Salish or Coast Salish peoples in, that have inhabited the Puget Sound area of Washington for thousands of years. Uh, they may, there's about 65 different tribes, and the Muckleshoot are one of them. They're descendants of the Duwamish people, meaning people of the inside, because they are closer inland from the, the coast, the Pacific coast. Um, and there is no Muckleshoot Health Department, but Valerie tells me that diabetes and diet-related illnesses are rampant in her community of about 2,500 members. She says it's an epidemic, and she's wondering when it's going to be declared as one, diabetes in particular. Um, so her nutrition education focuses on traditional foods and wild medicines, as I mentioned, of her ancestors, like nettles. Um, if you're familiar with stinging nettles, a lot of farmers know them as uh, weeds that sting them <laughs> painfully. But nettles are, are known for, um, excuse me, being a diuretic, um, helping lymph and adrenal glands, arthritis. Um, there's a whole list of illnesses that nettles are known for helping. They're high in iron, vitamin A, vitamin C, and potassium. And nettles are one of Valerie's passions. 
and she, she educates widely on nettles and a lot of other wild plants and wild medicine. And um, you know, she also talked, like Kevin did, about kind of the loss of harvesting lands. Um, the lot and fishing is a, it was a huge traditional foodways for Muckleshoot folks. And we talked a little bit about the salmon and what's going on um, on the west coast and the loss of salmon for people and how that's affecting health and and traditional foodways there. But she's she's doing a lot of education within her community, preserving these foodways and bringing back cultural traditions while addressing health needs in her community through uh, just going back to you know how, how her ancestors ate. And I think, and this is how we'll end it, is um, you know, the whole point of this project is kind of understanding and seeking out diversity of stories in our food and agricultural movement, right? Um, it's really the only way that we'll build a sustainable food system. Because just as we all know, we need biodiversity to sustain what we do on the farm, right? And I think that that rings true for our community. And it goes back to what we started with. You know, if we want to hit those three requirements of sustainability, we have to be socially responsible and we have to dig into these stories. We have to really understand you know, who are the farmers, who is our community, who are our food leaders? And, our, and, and as Valerie says, how can we live like our teachers, the plants and the foods around us? How can we learn to grow and thrive in diversity and be big medicine in the world? Thank you so much for your time. We have, maybe I should keep this on. We have like eight minutes yes. for some questions. Yes? Yeah, um, so I said in the beginning a little bit, um, you know, I, I didn't come from farming and um, I kind of got into farming. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't even know if I need this. Thank you. <laughs> um, you might be able to hear me. I'll try to project. Um, I kind of came into farming through this very, uh, you know, my first farm was on a hippie commune organic farm in West Virginia, right? And so uh, um, I was kind of looking at agriculture through this mainstream lens. And, and unfortunately, you know, and the way I started the presentation was basically showing kind of 94% uh, of our farmers are white. And, and the way that agriculture and kind of the good food movement is represented is, is a mainstream, very exclusive picture. So I wasn't very familiar with a lot of these farmers. I knew we were out there. I mean, how could we not be? You know, I, I mentioned my great grandmother. She came from a line of farmers, came from a line of sharecroppers. For me, the first faces of agriculture here are the indigenous. Um, folks that stewarded the land well before us. So I knew that obviously I wasn't the only brown girl farming, but <laughs> um, you know, it took me to kind of switch out of that mainstream lens that's, that's really driving the food movement and see what's going on in all of these communities. And there's a wide movement um, of really amazing farmers that have been doing this for, for a really long time.